All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to each 370 discussion. Uh, today is our second to last discussion, and we'll be looking at cache and virtual memory performance. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at data path performance, and now this is specifically looking at our cache and virtual memory performance. So before we were doing a lot of things with calculations and instructions. Now we're pretty much entirely focused on what it takes for loads and stores to be quick and efficient. Uh, before we get into that, note upcoming things. So project four due a couple of days after this recording, and then homework six due a week after. And then the final exam is coming up pretty soon. Uh, you can see the date, at least for the winter semester here. And if you have a conflict, you can look on Piazza, follow the form uh, to make sure that uh, you can take the exam at a time that doesn't conflict with other exams. So with that said, we'll start with the warm-up problem, the first problem on the worksheet for this week. Um, just to warm us up, we're, we're not really thinking about all the, uh, the ins and outs of virtual memory just yet. Um, but let's say that we're working with a cache. We have some program where 85% of our cache accesses are hits. And then 99.7% of the time that we get a main memory, we get a hit there. And then all the rest of the time, uh, we go to the disk. And so uh, notice that this 99.7 is really only uh, calculated uh, within the time that we miss in the cache. So if we get a hit in the cache, we don't even need to think about the 99.7% of the time that we get hit. And so in order to calculate this out, we're going to focus mostly on our miss rates. We're not going to really calculate things based on hit rates. So to start off, um, if we're going first to the cache and then to memory and then to the disk, uh, the very first thing that we'll do is access the cache, of course. And so in order to do that, uh, we'll just build in a two nanosecond delay for every single load and store that we have. So we'll start off with that. Uh, and then we need to take our miss rate in the cache, which is 0.15, and multiply that by whatever it's going to take to get things if we miss in the cache. And so that's going to take a constant 100 nanoseconds to first go to memory. And then if by chance we miss in memory, we are also going to go to the disk. And the reason why we do both of those things, we don't multiply the 100 nanoseconds by 99.7, is because uh, we have to know that something is not in memory before we go to the disk, uh, unless we're doing something in parallel, but that's pretty rare uh, because we don't want to really start a disk or memory operation until we know that we need to. So that might mess up LRU, it might take power, all these things in the background that we really don't want to do. So we are going to wait for the confirmation of a miss before we go on to the next component. And I'm not going to do that math by hand, but my next slide has it for me. Uh, once you add that up, that comes out to an average of 21.5 nanoseconds. Um, and so uh, let's say that our cache latency is about our clock cycle. That might take 20 cycles, 21, 22 cycles on average to get the data that, that we need. So even though we've added in the disk, because we've also added in the cache, we have something that's 80% faster than what we had before which was main memory. And the other thing is that uh, if now we are basing our clock period on our data path off the cache instead of main memory, uh, that's going to help us also with other instructions that are clocked, which is all instructions, I guess, besides loads and stores. So we can see how the cache and uh, the disk are, are even working together at this level for now. All right. Uh, so with that warm up, uh, we're going to get into virtual memory here, and we really need a basis for virtual memory. This will be lecture review for the next couple of minutes, um, but just to get us up to speed, uh, we have some issues with physical memory. Uh, the first is that uh, we have a finite size of physical memory, um, and in general, we want to write programs that will work on different systems. So we're writing something for LC2K. Uh, you know, our actual computer might have, uh, say, like 1,024 uh, bytes of or words of physical memory, but LC2K uses 16-bit addresses, and we want to access everything. Uh, maybe, perhaps, uh, before you've opened up your laptop and replaced the memory module, 
uh, how does everything still work the same without just breaking at that point? Uh, virtual memory is going to help us with that. Then from there, um, we also see that physical memory is not secure because we want processes to uh, essentially believe through abstraction that they have complete control over an entire address space. And so uh, if that's not the case, then programs are going to interfere with each other. And that has a couple issues because if we have a purposefully malicious program that could read unsecured data from another program, which would be bad. And it's really easy to install malware on our computers. It happens all the time, uh, even with all our, our malware uh, scanners and whatnot. It happens all the time. And so if we can still at least mitigate uh, the effects that malware has on other programs, if we can contain that to its own address space, then we're pretty well set. Uh, the other thing, even if it's not purposely malicious code, if we just have buggy code, that maybe leaks memory or reads bad locations, seg faults a lot. We don't want that crashing our whole system just because of one program. We want everything else to still be able to operate. And so we want to build up these barriers, these abstractions between programs so they can't modify each other or even read from each other. And then lastly, um, when we're doing a lot of our, our assembler type stuff and our linking stuff from the first part of the course, uh, when we're doing all the relocations or maybe updating, uh, resolving our labels to actual values, uh, those values are going to be constant numbers. And so if we copy that program from one computer to another, uh, we want that to be consistent. Um, so if a program needs a certain value at address uh, 1000, we want that to be accessible no matter what computer or other programs are running at the time. And so we can do that with virtual memory by giving each program its own address 1000 and the same for every other address, then uh, they won't interfere with each other. Uh, they will think that they have the exact value that they need at that address. And when they request that address from their processor, uh, they'll get that data that they need. And uh, really there's, there's no issues. There's no issues with getting bad data or anything else like that. And so virtual memory is going to solve all these issues for us. Okay. And so how we're going to do that, we're going to implement some sort of translation. Uh, we are going to turn our memory for each program into sort of like an array, but broken up into these different things called pages, which are gonna be similar to cache blocks. Um, and then uh, we'll only keep certain pages, certain sections of a program's memory array in physical memory at a time, and the rest of the time it'll be on the disk. Um, and so then we can kind of swap things in and out between the disk and physical memory uh, so that the data is always there. And then we'll use an LRU policy similar to our caches to make sure that it's uh, whatever is being accessed the most is going to be pretty quick. Uh, so similar to the idea of our cache being a subset of memory, now our physical memory is going to be a subset of the disk. You can think of it that way. Um, there's a little bit of nuance there because sometimes a page might only be in physical memory and not be exactly duplicated on the disk, um, but you can think of it that way. All right, um, so we're going to use a lot of the same language between caching and virtual memory. So hits and misses. So a hit means that it exists in physical memory and a miss, uh, which is going to also be called a page fault means that it doesn't exist in physical memory and we have to go to the disk. And so we call it a page fault because uh, this time we're not just looking up tags that are stored in physical memory. We're going to use a separate data structure. That's gonna be our page table. And that's going to uh, both translate addresses for us and also uh, tell us whether they're in physical memory or not. Uh, I guess really you could all call that translation because if it's not in physical memory, then it just translates to a disk location. Um, but there's some operating stuff, uh, operating system nuance that if you want to go take 482 and work on that some more. Um, one thing I've noticed that our caches, uh, even though in project four, we kind of have specific locations for our blocks and whatnot, um, our caches don't really have those numbered, or at least from the perspective of computer code, 
this is why there's so many different implementations of Project 4. We give you the starter code, and we, we say that there's generally about three different ways to organize your cache, uh, even with all the different parameters. Uh, and that's because there aren't like specific locations in the cache. Uh, we sort of assign locations to the cache dynamically with tags, uh, but for the physical memory and the virtual memory, it's going to be different. There are going to be exact locations corresponding to every virtual memory address that we give our virtual memory translator. So now just to recap uh, where we've come in the course. So we started off at the beginning of the course thinking mostly about just registers and main memory. Um, though, and then we added in this cache transaction. And the cool thing about the cache was that uh, we could add that in without changing really any of our computer code. So all your Project 1S LC2K code uh, is still valid for Project 4 um, because we've added this thing in between. And the only way that the programmer can tell that it even exists is because the cache is affecting our average access time. Um, with virtual memory, it's going to be similar, um, except I guess now we can access files from the drive, the hard disk, if we want to. Uh, but as far as accessing memory goes, the abstraction is still going to be there. Uh, the only way we're going to know that virtual memory exists is because some accesses will be slower. And that means that they've been evicted out of physical memory to the disk. And so we want to minimize that as much as possible by using some sort of LRU policy uh, to avoid how often we have to go to the disk. Right. So like I said before, um, instead of just accessing a block and checking the tag, uh, which is all done in hardware, this time we are going to have a mapping, which is sort of like a hash map almost, maybe more like an array, uh, that will take in a virtual address and give us a physical address. And the physical address is really going to be used by the processor. Uh, the computer code is not really going to know what that physical address is, but in the end, it'll get the data back. And so in order to implement this, why we talk about this in 370 is because we do have to implement some additional hardware in order to keep uh, that data, um, or, or rather that physical address, uh, not visible to the computer code. It's just going to work with the virtual address and the actual data that it needs. And so um, one cool thing about this mapping is that the virtual address can be any size now. Um, it can be smaller than the uh, physical memory address, although that's probably not very useful. Um, and it could be larger than the physical memory address, which is going to be more useful. Uh, for example, um, when I run Chrome on my computer, it typically takes up about eight gigabytes of uh, memory. And that's way too much. But before we switch to 64-bit systems, uh, we had 32-bit systems, and so our 32-bit systems can only address up to four gigabytes of memory, virtual or physical or otherwise. And that's because if we take two to the power of 32, um, that number of bytes is equal to four gigabytes. And so once we had programs that needed to access more than four gigabytes of virtual memory, uh, then we had to switch our virtual addresses from 32 bits to 64 bits in order to accommodate that. Uh, and that also allowed us to have just systems that went from uh, four gigabyte max RAM to now theoretically exabytes of maximum RAM, which I don't know, maybe we won't see it in many decades. Uh, maybe all of a sudden we'll see it pop up. Um, but we have a foundation, a framework that we can work on for a really long time now that we've switched to 64-bit addresses. So for example, Windows 11 is 64-bit only. Uh, Mac OS now is 64-bit only. So we're seeing 32-bit stuff starting to go away, and this is why. So all these translations are going to be encoded in the page table. Uh, and you can think of the page table as just a giant array that we are going to index uh, with um, sort of like a tag. Uh, it's going to be an address without a page offset. So just like uh, in project four with our caches, we remove the block offset temporarily, and then we index using our set and do some searching using our tag. It's going to be the same thing. We're going to chop off the page offset to get a virtual page number and then index into our page table. 
And then whatever piece of data is at that uh, index is going to be um, a combination of control bits. So similar to project four, valid bit, dirty bit, um, and others. And then it's also going to contain the physical page number, uh, which we're going to uh, combine with our original page offset. So the page offset is the same between the virtual address and the physical address. And then we'll have the actual physical address in the end. And so depending on the size of our physical page number and how many control bits we include, those values at those indexes might be different. Uh, whatever we uh, access with the virtual page number might be a different size. And so that's going to drive the sizes of our page tables as well. And so uh, in the end, uh, that will take us, uh, our, our physical page number will take us to a page. So a physical page is just a section of memory. So you can think of it in two ways. Either we combine the physical page number with our page offset and go straight to that location in physical memory, or we can go to the start of a physical page, a section of physical memory, and then index into that block pretty much that, that section using our page offset. So just like we indexed into a cache block with our block offset in project four. So let's look more at those page tables. Uh, so our page table uh, is always going to have some start address. If we're thinking of it in an array, it's just like uh, pointers in C and C++, because if you print out just like, I don't know, like the variable name of whatever array, like R, A, R, R, and you don't put brackets or anything, it will actually be a pointer to the first member of uh, that array. And so our page table register is going to be the same thing. It just points to the very beginning of that array. So here in this picture example, uh, we're only including a valid bit uh, and the physical page number. And so we would do some pointer arithmetic, take our page table register, uh, add it with our virtual page number, which would be our index, uh, do the pointer arithmetic, and then go to the uh, physical page number, which is our entry. Uh, that combined with our valid bit is our entry in our page table. And then once we have that page number, once again, uh, combine it with the offset and we get our final address. And so uh, with a single level page table, we will need one entry for every single uh, virtual page that might exist. Uh, so if we're thinking in terms of LC2K, which has 16 bit addresses, uh, let's say that we had, I don't know, uh, maybe like uh, a page offset of eight bits, right? So 256 words in a page. Let's define that as a page for now. Then uh, even if we don't use all 256 uh, pages, so that's that number is coming because uh, if we have 16 bits and 16 page offset bits, that means we also have 16, or sorry, eight, eight page offset bits, eight virtual page number bits, then we also have 256 possible virtual pages. So if we don't even access all 256 virtual pages, we would still need an entry for them in our page table. Um, because what if we do have to access uh, those pages at some point? Um, we have to account for that. And so that's going to motivate us to our multi-level page table. We're going to figure out that we can optimize some things for programs that don't use their entire address space all the time. Because if you look back at any of your test cases from these past few projects, even the multiplier, uh, the combination algorithm that you wrote, it's not using all of LC2K memory. So we can really uh, assume that it's only going to use certain bits, uh, certain sections of its physical address space or its virtual address space. And then we can optimize for that. Um, but for programs that do use the entire address space, a single level page table is going to make sense. So just to recap, pointing to all the things that we have, the, the main concepts to remember. So our page table register, that's the beginning of our page table. Um, our page offset is similar to a block offset, and it's the same for both virtual and physical addresses. Um, our page table is our uh, translation mechanism. We give it an index, which is our virtual page number, the leftmost bits of our address, and then of our virtual address rather, 
And then the contents of the page table entry will be a physical page number, which is the leftmost bits of our physical address. So that's how we're going to translate. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence here. Uh, it's, it doesn't go um, backwards. Um, we can't really get a physical address and to turn it into a virtual address. We could maybe find a virtual address that corresponds to that physical address. Uh, but a virtual address is a function. It's only going to give us one physical address. Right. So uh, a page fault, like I said before, is when we don't find the data in physical memory. And so we can tell if it's not in physical memory, not by going to the final physical address, we can just look in our page table and see if the valid bit is a zero. Because if the valid bit is a zero, no matter what junk is in the entry for physical page number, uh, we know that it must be on the disk. And so we don't have to go searching elsewhere in physical memory to find it. We just know to go ahead and go to the disk. And so most of the time our physical memory, at least uh, not, not at the beginning, but after sort of the startup stage, uh, it's going to be full. And so in order to bring in something that's on the disk, we have to evict something else, just like caches. And so we'll generally use LRU in each 370 to do that. Um, and specifically LRU in a fully associative manner. Uh, our pages, at least in 370, our, our page tables, we're going to think of them as fully associative. Uh, physical memory is going to be fully associative. We're not going to divide it really into sets. Um, I suppose we could if we wanted to, but I haven't seen that done. And so be prepared for either on the exam, I suppose. Um, that's something we could do. One more term I want you to know is a context switch. Uh, that means that we're changing programs. And if we're changing programs, uh, we're going to have to change page tables. And so we really only have to change our page table base registers um, so that we can look at the other page table whenever we start uh, accessing our virtual memory. And so if we uh, are, are using a new page table, a different page table, then most of the pages in there should uh, have zero as the valid bit. So we're going to get a lot of faults when we first switch to a different process. Um, but uh, if let's say that we switch processes for just a brief moment and then go back to our original process, uh, then we can just revert our page table base register and still have a lot of the pages from that original process uh, valid in physical memory. And so that's going to be really useful for us. All right, let's see, let's move on to problem two. Uh, we are going to simulate a page table access here. Uh, so let's say that we're using four kilobyte pages. And if we take the log base two of four kilobytes, by the way, four kilobytes, uh, that's uh, two to the two is four times two to the 10 bytes. That's a kilobyte. So we have a total of 12 page offset bits. So just like block offset, we just take the log base two of it to get our page offset bits. And then we have 16 kilobytes of physical memory. So we can divide. 16 kilobytes by four kilobytes to get four total pages in physical memory. Um, and so that's sort of like blocks, right? So it's like a four block cache pretty much. And then we have 20 bit virtual addresses that address bytes. So doing the math here, 20 bit addresses minus or 12 page offset bits, that's going to give us eight uh, virtual page number bits. So our virtual page numbers are going to range from 0 to 255. Um, that's probably not going to come up too heavily in this problem, but we'll see where it does come up. All right, so if we initially have virtual page 0 and physical page 1 and virtual page 1 and physical page 2, we're going to go through some accesses and see uh, how these things are going to go around. Uh, one thing to note, this is going to be pretty common. We're going to store our page table and physical page zero and not allow it to be evicted. Uh, because of course, if we evict the page table, then there's no way to do any more translations and then we're stuck. We're pretty much in an infinite loop because if we need to go to the page table, well, then we need to bring in the page table. Well, then we need to go to the page table and then it uh, never resolves. So let's look at this here. So again, if we have eight 
uh, page offset bits, or wait, it was 12, 12 page offset bits. Remember that 12 bits is equivalent to three hex digits because exactly four bits is equivalent to one hex digit. So I'm just going to divide up our page numbers from our page offsets here. And then uh, we can sort of ignore the page offsets until we're reconstructing our physical address. And for now, just look at the virtual pages. So everything to the left of my line that I just drew here is going to be our virtual page. So doing that real quick, here we have virtual page 0, 1, uh, hex 20, uh, 0, 0, hex 30, uh, 1, and 0. And the only reason I don't mention hex for 1 and 0 is because they're the same in decimal as hex. So just to make it simple. All right. Um, let's see. I think we said that physical page 1 is initially in virtual page uh, or, or let's see, no reverse. Virtual page zero is in physical page one, and virtual page one is in physical page two, and there's physical page three. So let's look. Uh, I guess it's initially empty, we'll assume. And let's look at our accesses. So first, we'll access virtual page zero, so it's not a fault. And then to get our physical address, we'll just combine our physical page, which looking at our table, um, really this should kind of be reversed because we want to index into the page table uh, with our with our virtual page. But I guess really we're, we're looking this direction, I suppose. Um, anyway, uh, so we see that our physical page number for virtual page zero is going to be a one. So we can just reconstruct using that physical page number with our original page offset, which was FOC. Right, uh, for virtual page one, it'll be the same thing, not a page fault since it exists in physical memory. Then we'll do the exact same thing just with the new uh, physical page number. So now we're gonna access virtual page 20. That is a page fault. Uh, and that's because we don't see virtual page 20 anywhere in physical memory. So we're going to bring it into physical memory. And then are we done? Think about that for a second. Uh, do we need to fill in this last column for the physical address? The answer is yes, because even though we've just brought the data into our physical memory, now we need to allow it to go to the processor. So we need an actual address uh, once we brought it in, and this address will only be valid after we brought it in. The address won't really make sense before we've brought in the page uh, from the disk. So now we'll just do the exact same thing. And uh, now our physical page number is three, so we'll combine that with our page offset of FOC. Whoa, that's weird. And uh, we will have our data that we can send back to the processor. Let me erase that weird line that I made. All right. So now let's say that we're accessing virtual page zero yet again. Um, and we see that virtual page zero is still in physical memory. So we'll do the same thing, uh, not a page fault. Combine physical page one with our offset, which is now 100. And then same thing for the next line. Combine our physical page number with our offset. Okay. Now let's say that we're accessing virtual page 30. So just looking at our table on the left, we see that 30 is not in physical memory. So we will have a page fault. So now, because our page table, or rather our physical memory is full, we're going to need to evict something in order to bring in virtual page 30 from the disk. And so looking at our accesses, our, our least recently used page that currently exists in physical memory is going to be virtual page one. So we are going to evict virtual page one and then replace it with virtual page 30. And so then we can take our new physical page number, which is two, which used to correspond to virtual page one, now it corresponds to virtual page 30. Uh, and we're going to combine that with our page offset, which here is zero, all right? But oh no, we need to access virtual page one again. So we'll do the same thing. We'll take the least recently used page, which is now page 20, virtual page 20, and replace it with one. And so that means that uh, physical page three now corresponds to virtual page one, 
where physical page two used to correspond to virtual page one. And so we will have a page fault there. And same thing, we will take our physical page number, which is now three, and combine it with our offset. So notice uh, the first time that we access virtual page one here, uh, and the second time that we access virtual page one. So between these two times, our physical page numbers were different, which means that our physical addresses were completely different. So if this time, instead of accessing FFF, we had accessed FOC, uh, this time it would be hex 03 FOC, but the first time we access that address is 02 FOC, and it's the same data. Uh, that's, that's the thing to keep in mind. It's the same data, it's just been moved around. And so uh, to the processor, because the process or the program, because the program is only going to see the virtual address, one FOC, um, it's going to have no knowledge that it was moved around. Uh, it's just going to have the data and maybe it'll see that uh, it took a long time to access the data this time. So to finish this out here, we'll access virtual page zero again. It's still in our physical memory, so we won't have a page fault. We'll do the same thing that we've done the whole time, which is combining our physical page number with our offset, which here is 200. All right, um, let's move on here. Um, so now we'll get to multi-level page tables and multi-level page tables are going to uh, have the goal of being more memory efficient um, in the general case. So like I said before, if we have a program that accesses all of its uh, virtual address space, then every time it makes an access, it will just go into the single level page table, find its entry, and then go to its physical memory. Uh, but if we have a program, like most of our programs from Project 1S, or maybe this whole course uh, in LC2K, we're really only accessing up to maybe address 50, uh, which, isn't, uh, which isn't very big. And so uh, if we use a multi-level page table, uh, maybe we can adjust our sizes to where we have one uh, first level page table that we ask or access, and then we only ever need to access one of the second level page tables, and all the others just don't get created. Um, and the reason that we don't create them is because if we never access those ranges, uh, then of course we never need to put them into physical memory, uh, but that means theoretically uh, we could access them from the disk if we need to. And so we would. Um, I guess the next slide will help with that. We would just keep our valid bits uh, for table for second level tables that are never created. We would just keep the valid bits in the first level to zero. Because um, it, it's implied that if we were to create a second level, then all the valid bits for those final physical pages would be zero. So that's kind of the thought process here. And so this kind of takes on a tree-like structure. Um, but the thing is, we will always, always, always start at the first level page table. So our first level page table, uh, whatever address that starts at, that's what we're going to act, um, that's what we're going to uh, update our page table base register to be. So our page table base register will always point to the first level, All right? And so that means that the first level page table always has to be valid. It can't not exist like the second levels could. Um, from there, we could have you know, multiple levels. We could have three levels. We could have any number of levels. Um, and so the tree-like structure would change, but the basic algorithm is going to be the same no matter what. So let's look at the implementation here. So we'll start off with our page table base register. And then in order to actually make our multi-levels useful, we are going to split up what was our originally our virtual page number. We're going to split it up into multiple fields. So we're going to take perhaps the first half. It doesn't have to be a half. It could be any size of the virtual page number. And we'll use that as an index into our first level page table. And then we'll take the rest of uh, the virtual page number and use that to access the second level page table. So through that, we can see that for any different value of a virtual page number, it's going to uh, 
uh, map to a distinct entry in some second level page table. So if our first level offset perhaps is zero, um, that will take us to one second level page table. If our first level offset is one, it'll take us to a different second level page table. And all the physical pages that those two page tables are pointing to will point to different things. So they'll all be distinct. And so we know that our virtual page numbers won't really have any overlap uh, unless we specifically need it to, which is something for 42 if you're interested in that. And so in the end, we will still get our physical page number and our control bits, just like before. We'll combine our physical page number with the page offset to get our final address that so we can index directly into physical memory. So some things to think about, because we are talking about performance day. Uh, now we're accessing the page tables multiple times uh, and every memory access is, is kind of costly. Um, so before, I guess really before virtual memory, we would just access memory and that'd be it. Uh, but now we need to first access our page table and then access physical memory. And then now if we have a multi-level page table, we'll access level one, then level two, then finally our actual data. So now we've increased the number of accesses greatly uh, in order to get security and consistency and the ability to access all the virtual address spaces. So there's some trade-off here. Um, but after we kind of look at uh, the sizes of a multi-level page table, uh, we're going to see how that actually impacts our performance. So let's do this problem where we're going to figure out the size of a two-level page table. So let's say that we have 32-bit virtual addresses, so we can uh, address no more than uh, four gigabytes of virtual memory, uh, but we only have four megabytes of physical memory. So uh, our virtual memory is going to be uh, two to the 10 times larger than our, our physical memory. Let's say that we also have 16 kilobyte pages. Uh, so knowing those two things, we can immediately divide four megabytes by 16 kilobytes to get the number of physical pages. And so let's see, so that's two to the 22 divided by uh, two to the 14. So that comes out to two to the what eight total uh, physical pages that exist in our physical memory array. And so that's going to give us eight uh, physical page number bits. Also, uh, taking the log base two of 16 kilobytes, uh, that's going to give us 14 uh, page offset bits. 14 page offset bits. And so combining the physical page number with the 14 page offset bits, uh, that means our physical addresses will be 22 bits long, which I, I guess we could just get if we take the log base two of uh, our physical memory size. So two to the 22 means 22 physical address bits. So there's all these different ways that we can get these numbers. Um, so also finally for every entry, uh, I suppose in both levels, we're going to say that we have eight control bits, valid, dirty, other things, LRU perhaps. Um, so let's say that we have that. And then finally, there's this one thing that we will say a couple times in this course. Assume that our page tables fit in one page. And so this means uh, that we can treat our page tables themselves just like any other page of physical memory, which means that we can evict it to the disk if we aren't really finding it useful. And we can bring it back to physical memory when uh, it becomes useful again. So that'll be really useful for us. But for this problem, that means that our page tables have a size of 16 kilobytes, which is our page size, if we look up here. All right, first question, how many entries do we have in the second level page table? Um, well, we need uh, an entry, um, or we need enough entries to fill up the entire second level page table. And so if our second level page table is one page, which is 16 kilobytes, uh, we need to calculate our entry size 
so that we can divide our page table size by our entry size to get the number of entries. And so what will go into an entry? Well, like I said before, our entries are going to be our control bits with our physical page number bits. So going back here, um, we said that we had eight physical page number bits and eight control bits. So uh, an entry will be our eight control bits plus our eight physical page number bits, which is 16 bits. And 16 bits is two bytes. So if we divide our 16 kilobytes by two bytes, uh, that will get us, oh, let's see, two to the power of 13 total entries, which is what I have here, about 8,000 entries. So we'll have 8,192 entries in every single second level page table. So let's move on. So now, how many virtual address bits are we going to use to index into the second level page table? So we have two to the power of 13 entries. That means we can use 13 bits to index into every single entry in that array. And so we'll just use 13 bits to index in the second level. Now let's go back for a second. We had 32 bit virtual addresses. We had uh, 14, right, uh, page offset bits. So if we subtract our 32 bits by 13 and 14, uh, that comes out to, let's see, 32 minus 27, that'll get us five first level index bits, which is what I have there. So that means that our first level page table is going to be really small. Uh, if we're still using uh, the same entry size, which we may or may not, uh, then that means that we'll just have our control bits and our, uh, our, 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 our pointers, rather, to the second level page tables. Um, and then we'll only have two to the power of five of those, so we'll only have 32 of those. It'll be a really small array for our first level page table. And so that will be a really small, really space efficient, um, especially if we're only using a few of the second level page tables. OK, so that brings us to our last question. How much memory is used in the worst case? Um, and that's going to be um, assuming that we have to bring in every single second level page table into physical memory. So we said that there were 8,192 second level page tables that are two to the power of what, 14 bytes apiece because they're each a page, 16 kilobytes. And so if we add that all up and then add that with our first level page table, uh, we will get the worst case memory. Now that does ask us to calculate the size of the first level page table. And there's a couple different ways to do that. We do know because it's a page table There'll be no more than 16 kilobytes because it has to fit in a page. So if we wanted to, we could just take uh, 8,193 and multiply that by 16 kilobytes. That would give us sort of an upper bound, uh, assuming that we wouldn't put anything in memory alongside our first level page table. But if we want to get real specific with it, we do need to calculate the size of our first level page table. And still, there's multiple ways to do that. Uh, and this is an important nuance. Sometimes uh, we are going to store pointers in our first level page table that point to the start location of the second level page table. And then sometimes we are just going to store page numbers, physical page numbers in our first level page table, as well as our second level page table. And we're allowed to do that because our second level page tables fit in one page of physical memory. So that means that they too have physical page numbers and we don't have to store the full address because we know that the last bits, whatever page offset bits are going to be zeros if we're looking for the start of the second level page table. So we have two options here. We could just say, oh, uh, we're not going to align our second level page tables with the beginning of a physical page. Now that seems pretty silly to me, but we could do it. And so in order to do that, we would have to store the full physical address of the start of our second level page table. And from uh, our size of physical memory, we know that that would be two 
to the power of 12. Let's see. So that would get us 12 physical address bits. If I'm doing that right. I think I had that before. Yep. Or 22, not 12. I thought that sounded wrong. So 22 bits. So that means that every entry would be 22 bits plus or eight control bits. And we'd probably round up to the nearest byte. So that would get us a total of four bytes per entry. But we could do something much, much smarter. And we could just store a physical page number with our control bits and go back to adding what we had before, which was our eight control bits plus our uh, eight physical page number bits that correspond to the second level page tables. And then we still have two byte entries. So then we take that, multiply that by the number of entries in our uh, first level page table, which we said was 32. And so in the end, we would get either 64 or 128 uh, bytes for our first level page table. And we add that with the total size of the second level page tables all combined, and uh, we could get that all together. And I suppose the actual answer was none of the methods I discussed where we have just our physical address for the second level page table without control bits. So I would argue that uh, we, we need to add some control bits here. Maybe they sit in the last two bits when we round up to byte, who knows. Um, but in whatever we have on the slide here, it's three bytes per entry. So we just multiply that by the number of entries to get our size of the first level and add that all together with the size of all of our second levels combined. And that gets pretty large. Um, luckily though, it does not exceed the size of physical memory, but it's quite possible uh, if we had really, really large virtual addresses, maybe 64-bit virtual addresses uh, with only four megabytes of physical memory, that even our page tables would exceed the size of physical memory, in which case we would have to employ multi-level page tables uh, and evict them back to the disk pretty frequently. So now uh, that's getting away from page tables. Now we're going to look at the real performance stuff, go back to sort of the warm up question that we had. So before we do that, uh, I need to introduce this idea that from what I hear hasn't quite been uh, introduced in lecture yet. It will be, so don't worry. Uh, if this sounds confusing, just wait for lecture. Um, but we are going to add in this performance boosting thing before we look at the actual access times. Uh, we are going to um, want to avoid going to physical memory as much as possible. And that's going to really be a pain when we're trying to do our translations. So we've, we've been thinking about going through our page tables. We take a virtual address. We need to turn it into a physical address. The only way to do that is to go into physical memory and do the translation. Um, and then that kind of makes our cache useless because if then we take our physical address and we go to the cache, um, then the, uh, the time improvement that we got from the cache, maybe we went from 100 nanoseconds to 10, uh, is really going to be undone since now we're doing 110 nanoseconds because we have to go to physical memory to do the translation and then we go to the cache to get our data. And so it's kind of pointless in the end. Um, maybe, maybe we are caching uh, our page tables as well. And maybe it takes only 20 nanoseconds, uh, one for the first access to cache and one for the second access to cache. Either way, that's still going to give us um, a pretty big downgrade for our access time. And so we're going to come up with this thing called the translation look aside buffer, which is pretty much a cache of translations. Um, and it's not called a translation cache because the translation look aside buffer actually came about uh, before caches were really a big thing. And so in this class, we're going to call it the TLB all the time. I'm probably never going to say full translation look aside buffer again. I'm just going to say TLB, TLB, TLB. Uh, and so this is going to be a cache um, that is going to be tagged with our uh, virtual page numbers instead of you know, tags from our caches. Um, and so once we give our translation look aside buffer, 
I guess I said it again, our TLB, our virtual page number, it's going to give us our physical page number pretty immediately. And then once again, we'll combine that with our page offset in order to construct our final address and move on our merry way. And we never have to look at the page table, which is gonna be really nice. Um, and so it, it's going to be a hardware thing. This isn't gonna be in software. So that means that uh, we will have to do some evictions occasionally once we reach the maximum size of the TLB. Um, but if we use LRU, then most of the time our, uh, our, our lookups are gonna be pretty quick. Our lookups, uh, same thing as translations. So let's look at what we had before. Before we would uh, take an address, go to our page table base register, look at our page table in memory, which took a while. And then we get our physical page offset. We go back, combine that with, or sorry, our physical page number, combine that with our page offset and boom, now we get a memory or the cache and have our data. So now we're going to introduce the TLB, which is going to cut out this access here. And so uh, we'll start off, we won't even look at our page table base register. We'll start off with the TLB. If we find our virtual page number in the TLB, uh, then we will have our, uh, our, our physical page number and we can immediately combine that with the page offset and then only make the one access to memory. So pretty sweet. Um, note that the TLB is going to be very small. It's going to be fully associative uh, because um, just the way our tags work, the set indexing doesn't really make sense for uh, our, our virtual memory because as you access larger and larger pages, I suppose, compared to blocks in your cache, the uniform distributions aren't really so uniform anymore. So we use set indices for our caches because the theory was that uh, we're generally on average accessing each set equally, just based on addresses, a normal distribution of addresses, um, or rather a uniform distribution of addresses. But that's really not going to be the case when we're accessing large chunks. It's going to be pretty disuniform. And so in order to fix that, we just won't have sets in our TOB. We will just have tags, which would be our virtual page number. And so if our virtual page number is not in the TLB, then we'll look it up in our, uh, our, our page table, our actual page table in memory, and it may or may not be a fault. But if a virtual page number does exist in the TLB, that means it necessarily will not be a page fault. Uh, and that's because this means that we've accessed it before, so it has to be in uh, physical memory. Um, it's, it's not going to have, it's, it won't have been evicted um, if it exists in the TLB. Um, if it exists from the, or if it doesn't exist in the TLB, it could still be either in physical memory or not. And we just have to check the page table for that. But if it's in the TLB, it will not be a page fault. And so now in the end, we've cut out this access to memory, this additional one. One other thing to note, our TLB, because it's fully associative and pages are just so large, we're not going to be working with that many virtual page numbers at a time. The TLB will have only a few entries. And so that means that the propagation delay for that component is going to be really quick. It'll actually be faster than our cache propagation delay most of the time. And so this is a really small component, but it's really useful. It's going to tremendously improve our access times. So. Um, with that said, we're, we now have two options. Um, we can either uh, create regular caches that we've had so far. I call it regular. It's, I guess you could call the other one regular. I would call a physically addressed cache a regular cache. Um, but like I said before, in order to bring the physical address to our cache, we have to actually get the physical address. And so that means that we have to do our address translation first. Um, and so that's going to involve our TLB. That will sometimes involve our page table. Um, and then it'll go to the cache. But this time we have another option. We can also make all the addresses and tags and set bits and block offset bits and all that in our cache correspond to virtual addresses instead. And so that means if a program 
uh, requests data from an address, we can go straight to the cache. And if it's, in, it's, if it's in the cache, we just return that. And then only if we get a miss in the cache, we know that we're gonna take a hit to our access time anyway. And so then we do our translation. So the, the hope is that we really speed up our translations um, or our accesses by just going to the cache uh, if we're guaranteed to get a hit. Um, and then only doing all the extra stuff if we know that we have a cache miss. The caches are like, what, one, two clock cycles. We can get most of our accesses to one, two clock cycles instead of doing a translation every single time. Then we've tremendously improved our access time. But we do have to see a couple other things. We, we have to test our theory with actual numbers before we know if it's going to work. So before we get to the actual numbers, just to recap what I just said, if we have a physically addressed cache, all of our tags in our cache are going to uh, be physical addresses. So that means that we have to go to our page table in order to get our physical page number first. So same deal as before, take our virtual page number, index into the page table. Uh, maybe we do the multi-level thing, who knows? And then in the end, get a physical page number, get our page offset, and then I go to the cache. Now this image here, um, it divides up the page offset uh, based on the tag and index and block offset. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation between those. Um, if you go to uh, EX470, there's this thing called the virtually indexed physically addressed cache. Um, I'll actually talk about that in a minute. Um, but this idea of uh, our cache fields directly uh, relating to our virtual memory fields is not exactly one-to-one. -one. Um, and that's mainly because our uh, blocks are going to be so much smaller than our page offsets. Uh, even the sizes of our cache might be smaller than a page. Um, and so probably the page offset is still going to contain uh, bits of the tag for our cache. Um, but the physical page number will probably contain the rest of our tag. Um, I guess there's some situation where you might have really small pages where the set index is part of the physical page number, but we'll see with the virtually indexed physically tagged cache why that's not the case. So um, this is kind of the flow here. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is going to be the tree that we're going to use for a physically addressed cache. I do want to see something real quick. Let's see. I'm just wondering about these tag comparisons. Um, this is sort of an insight into hardware that we haven't really talked about in 370, but I do want to point this out. Um, when we think about project four, we're probably going linearly through an array of blocks in our sets, uh, but that's not really how it happens. Uh, in hardware, we're doing all these things in parallel. And so once we've selected our set, we're going to essentially send the tag to a bitwise comparator. So that could be an XNOR or it could be a subtraction uh, to check if it's the same. And then um, when a hit or a miss occurs, all of these comparisons are going to update to the same thing. Um, so we're not going to look at set zero way zero first and then wait to see if it's a hit or miss before we look at set zero way one. Uh, we're just going to do both of those things at the same time. And then one of them maybe will spit out a hit and then we'll get the data from whichever one hit. Um, that is something important that I want to point out is that discusses hardware implementation. Anyway, with that aside, let's look at the actual sort of flow chart uh, for a physically addressed cache. So we will always start with our virtual address. So if we have a physically addressed cache, before we go to the cache, we have to translate it. So we're going to try our luck at the TLB. And if the TLB gets a hit, mm, good. We do not have to go to physical memory. So we'll just go straight to the cache, get a hit or a miss. If we get a miss, of course, we'll go to memory. And then uh, we'll, we'll um, go send that data to our processor and move on with our program. Now, one thing about that. If we get a hit in the TLB, like I said before, that means it won't be a page fault. So that's why after memory, there's no arrow going to the disk. 
Um, we will only go to the disk if we know we have a page fault. So let's look at that. So if we did get a miss in the TLB, now there's a possibility for a page fault. Uh, if we go through our page table, which is memory, and we get a hit, oh, we don't have a page fault, we're good. We can then get our address, update our TLB along the way, so we can store that translation for the next time it's used. And then now we go to our cache, same deal, hit or miss. If we miss, we get a memory. So in that scenario, uh, there's a possibility where we could go to the TLB, then our page table, then our cache, then our memory, and then finally get our data. We have to check all those things. Um, but if we get a miss in our page table, that is a page fault, uh, we know it can't exist in physical memory or the cache, so we won't access those again. We'll go straight to the disk. And then uh, as we're sending that data to the processor, we'll also update the TLB and memory. Um, those might be in parallel or they might be sequential. Uh, let's say for uh, this problem that we're about to do, that we'll do it uh, in parallel. So the sort of circles on this flowchart, we're not going to record uh, latencies for those. We'll just record latencies for the boxes. But uh, this, this one in particular, because it's memory, uh, that might be a box most of the time. Updating the TLB, it's more of a hardware thing. Uh, not controlled by the operating system. So that's probably not going to be a thing. All right, let's see here. So I said we would do a problem with the physical address cache. Here it is. Let's say that we have these hit rates and access times. So TLB is going to get like an insanely high hit rate, 99.5% an access time of one cycle, a 90% hit rate in our cache with an access time of 10 cycles. And then main memory will have a 99.99% .99 hit rate uh, with an access time of 90 cycles, and then our disk is going to contain everything, 100% hit rate, but it takes a really, really long time. So let's see what we would do to get our average access time in terms of cycles. Um, and by the way, these are just notes recapping the flow chart that I just had. Um, we'll do TLB and cache sequentially. Uh, TLB hits won't have page faults. Uh, we aren't going to cache the page table. We'll just allow it to be cached in the TLB, and that will increase our cache hit rate. Um, and then um, we're going to do all our updates in parallel. Like I was just saying, the circles will be circles and not boxes. So how long is our average access time? In order to figure this out, um, we need to go through our flowchart. So step one, like I said before, is always going to be accessing the TLB. And so we will have a constant one cycle access. Um, now, if we get a hit, which will happen 0.995 fraction of the time, then we will uh, access our cache, which will be 10 cycles. And then 10% uh, of that time, we will also have to go to main memory. So this here is our cache plus memory average access time, assuming we get a hit in the TLB or have some translation. Now I say, what if we have some translation? Instead of just multiplying that step by 0.995, we could add that with any time that we have um, an address. So that would be 0.995. So that's our hit rate in the TLB uh, plus our miss rate in the TLB, 0 0.005, multiplied by our hit rate in the page table, which looking at this third line item here will be 0.9999. So uh, this here is the probability of having to get a, uh, uh, or having a translation from the TLB plus the translations from memory and then multiplied by the cache plus miss and cache memory access time. And then now we just need to calculate uh, how often we need to go to the disk. We'll only go to the disk if we miss in the TLB, uh, we miss in main memory, which will be very, very small, 0001 fraction of the time. Uh, and then we'll multiply that by our disk access time, which would be 80,000 cycles. And so I'm going to let the slide do the math for me. That's going to come out to the following. Um, so just to recap, 
let's see. Uh, here is our um, disk. Oh, I did forget one thing. Um, let's see. If we get a miss in the TLB, uh, we will have to um, also access our page table, which will be 90 cycles because it's memory. Forgot about that. And then only 0 0.0001 fraction of that time will we go to the disk. So I forgot about that. So here is our uh, TLB miss, which is the fraction of the time that we missed in the TLB times our constant page table lookup time plus our disk time and the rate that we have to access the disk. Um, and then to the end, we have our cache access time, uh, which is the 10 cycles plus the amount of time we miss in the cache. Um, and then multiplied the, by the actual amount of time that we have an address that we've translated and we can go to the cache. That is the amount of time that we haven't gone to the disk. Okay, um, cool. So now, uh, I think there was possibly something that was missed. Oh yeah, the reason I didn't include our, uh, our, our page table access time before is because we would still access the page table uh, if we get a hit in the page table. And that was something I didn't include before. So all the math works out to the same and we get an average of 20.5 cycles, um, which is a lot, but mm, um, it kind of depends on your clock period and your other instructions to see how that actually matters. So now let's look at the virtually addressed cache. This is our other option. Uh, the idea here is to go to the cache with a virtual address, and then only if we miss the cache do we go do all the other stuff. Um, there are some issues with this, and the main one comes from our context switching, uh, because if our virtual memory is only valid for one process, uh, if we're no longer going to the page table, we're no longer accessing the page table base register to check if it's valid for that process, uh, then we have to invalidate the cache whenever we switch processes, or in addition to tagging uh, our cache with the virtual address, we would also have to tag it with our process number. The process numbers are really, really big actually, so that's why we don't do that. Instead, we're just going to invalidate the cache when we switch processes. So let's look here. Um, and surprisingly enough to me, this is actually less common than physically addressed cache. I would expect that this would be more common um, based on what we're about to see in the problem. Um, in my opinion, it's simple uh, compared to the physically addressed cache, not as many tree parts to follow, um, but invalidating the cache entirely does get really expensive. So let's look here. Um, we are going to use our virtual address bits, once again, to calculate our index and tag, and I suppose the block offset. All of it will come from the virtual address and that'll be the idea here. So let's look at the process here. So first we'll go to the cache, and then if the data corresponding to that virtual address is there, we get a hit, we're done. We can just move on with our instructions. But if we miss, then we are going to have to go to physical memory. In order to go to physical memory, we have to do our translation. So we'll do our TLB, look up in the TLB. If we get a hit in the TLB, great. We can go to memory, get our data, done. Otherwise, we'll have to access memory for the page table. If we get a hit, great. We'll go to memory again. So two memory accesses in a row and then go to uh, the processor. But if we miss in the cache, miss in the TLB, miss in the page table, then we'll have to go to the disk, which will take a while. So let's look at the math here. <clears throat> So we have the same hit rates and access times as before. Uh, instead of starting with the TLB this time, that constant really quick one cycle that we had before, now we'll start with the cache, which will be a constant 10 cycles. Um, and this will make the math really easy uh, because all the rest of the stuff that we're about to do, we'll just multiply it by the cache miss rate. So plus 0.1, that 10% of the time that we miss in the cache, so we'll immediately go to the TLB, so constant one cycle. Um, and then if we, uh, really if we hit or miss in the TLB, either way, we're gonna have to go to memory, either to get the data or to do our page table. So I'm going to add a constant 90 cycles there. 
uh, but only if we miss in the page table, or rather, if we get a hit in the page table, which is 0 0.9999% of the time, we will uh, go to main memory again. So there's our 90 seconds there, but that 0 0.10001 fraction of the time that we get a miss in the page table will go to the disk. And that's how the math works out. So as you can see, this formula is a lot more simple than the last one that we had for the physically addressed cache, which is why I think these are more simple. Um, and I'm kind of surprised that they aren't as common. Um, but if we do the actual numbers there and do the math and all that, um, I did distribute some things differently on the slide. We get an access time on average of 19.2 cycles. Um, and so, that's going to be what, about a cycle and a half faster than the physically addressed cache. The one thing that this problem isn't taking into account is uh, all the invalidations that come from switching contexts. When we switch our program, our cache rate, our cache miss rate is going to go up for a while uh, because everything's just going to be a miss. It can be invalid. Uh, we will basically clear all the valid bits to zero um, and, and like rerun our project four code from the beginning, essentially. And so um, in theory, uh, this number 19 would probably be much higher if we were switching processes even once. So to wrap up, um, I want to go over the, the, the analogies. Oh, and I did forget to go over the virtually indexed physically tagged cache. I guess I can do that real quick. Let's see, I'm trying to find a blank slide. Maybe I'll do that at the end. Um, before, so before we get to that, I'll wrap up our virtual memory, uh, comparing it to a cache um, and just all the components that we have to keep it all straight. Um, so if we have a cache, we can choose to give that a virtual or physical address and our cache will give us data or it'll tell us that we have a miss. Physical memory will always take a physical address and spit out data. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, page tables, which are in physical memory, will take virtual addresses and give us either physical addresses or they'll tell us that there's a page fault. Our TOB will take a virtual address always and always give a physical address or tell us that there's a fault um, or, or rather a miss. It would be a miss, not a fault. And then finally our disk, um, in 370, we're going to abstract out the idea of a disk location. Uh, might as well think of it as a pointer, although that's not really accurate for disks. Um, and it'll give us data in the end. So we have all these terms that you can definitely copy down for your final cheat sheet. We also have this analogy, just thinking about the similarities and differences between caches and virtual memory. It's like blocks and pages, um, tags and page numbers. Um, there's one in quotes here, the cache block number, which I said doesn't really exist beyond hardware. It's not accessible to the programmer or the operating system even. So that's why it's in quotes there. Uh, but misses, faults, all those things are going to be about us. And then we also have some formulas. Uh, make sure you know these formulas uh, and the ones on this page. Uh, you can look back at the slides, copy them down for the final cheat sheet. Um, but if you don't know what they actually mean, then they won't be useful on the exam. So that's, uh, that's what we have. I will just take these last couple minutes and go over a virtually indexed physically tagged cache because I think it's a really cool thing that we can do. Um, so the idea is that we want to access the TLB. Well, let me oh, go back. I'll just make a duplicate slide here. Duplicate slide and delete this content. Okay, I'll have to reshare, I'm sure. Yes, all right. Okay, so the idea here is that we want to trim down even more uh, accesses that are going on in this tree. We want to reduce our latency, right? And so this time, uh, we're going to combine the ideas of the virtually addressed cache, where we go to the cache first and then the TLB, with the idea for the physically addressed cache, where we access the TLB and then the cache. Um, and we can do this, uh, what, what I'm about to say, because the TLB 
has an access time that's comparable to the cache. It's actually shorter. And so that might lead us to think that we can do those things in parallel, which is exactly what we're going to do. So let's look at this. So we would first uh, access the TLB. So here's the TLB, but we would do that in parallel with the cache. And so in order for this to work, we have to have whatever address uh, is actually going to the cache. Uh, but how do we do that? Uh, if we haven't translated it yet, um, and we want to do it in parallel, um, we are going to take our address, which has a virtual page number, right? And then our page offset. And then knowing that that's also going to be equivalent to our cache tag with our set index, with our block offset, we're going to partition our page offset to fully contain the set and block offset. Um, and so uh, that means that um, we are going to know which set our final data is in just from uh, the virtual address. We don't need to translate the physical address in order to get the set. And this might not make sense in the context of project four, but if we go back and see if I can find the one slide I had that kind of showed uh, what this looked like. Um, here it is. This is the one that I paused on earlier. Um, we think of going through our caches sequentially um, and doing the comparison and then moving on to the next block in the cache. But this isn't really what's going on. We are accessing a set, and our set is giving us essentially a list of all the tags that are in the set. And then in hardware, we're comparing them all in parallel uh, to figure out which one has our actual data that we're looking for. And if it's none of them, then we get a miss in the cache. This is going to be the same idea. So let's look here. So we will go to our TLB and our cache. And so since our page offset is going to contain the set index, we know which set we'll index into. And the set, uh, I'll let's see, go into the set with the cache, it'll spit out the list of tags. Uh, and this is called virtually uh, indexed because the set index existed in the page offset. You could also call it physically indexed because of course the page offset is the same between the virtual address and the physical address. Um, but physically tagged. Or VIPT. And so um, now we have a list of tags, physical tags in that set. And so before we just compared them with uh, whatever tag we were looking for. Um, but now our tag is going to be defined by the virtual page number, or rather the physical page number. Um, which means that we can't extract it from the virtual page number. But if we give the TLB the virtual page number, we'll get the physical page number before the cache is even done. And then from there, we can extract, or from all of that, we can get the tag and then go do that with our tag comparison. I'm going to abbreviate tag comparison TC. So we have multiple uh, tags, multiple ways in our set then we'll just bring the tag into our tag comparison. And then we will know um, at the end whether the cache has the thing that we're actually looking for. And so at this point, we can uh, sort of roll the TLB and the cache into one thing. And of course, if we get a miss in the end, then we'll go to um, our, our physical memory one way or another. Um, if we got a hit in the TLB, but a miss in the cache, there's still um, a possibility that we might just go to physical memory um, instead of doing the whole page table thing. Um, but if we, if we get a miss in the cache, we might need to go to the page table, we might not to. So there's some other math. Um, but the key is that the, um, like the, the best case access time is reduced from the TLB plus the cache to just, I guess, whichever one's longer. So that's the VIP T cache. Also, that's everything I have for today. I will be back next week with 
uh, hopefully homework five or six related things and some exam review. And so we'll see you next time.